Kia ora, good evening, and uh, welcome to the University of Canterbury. Um, tonight's talk is going to be uh, focusing on some harsh issues. It's going to be focusing on a few things that you might have seen in the media. It's going to challenge us in uh, many ways. In one, I know that an issue such as what's happening in Europe uh, right now it sort of divides people right down the middle. My talk tonight is going to be uh, two, two things. First of all, I'll tell you the story of how I managed uh, or how I, met, how I am standing before you today. And then uh, the second half will focus on what's happening in terms of the global refugee crisis and bring it back locally and see uh, where New Zealand sits on the issue. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers uh, as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, have the panel involved. My name is Abbas Nazari. I was born in Afghanistan, right there, um, in the uh, mountains of Afghanistan in the provinces. Uh, that's our village. Uh, it's standing. I went back to Afghanistan in 2012 and I took that photo standing on a hill overlooking the valley that we, we uh, grew up and lived in. It's our house, front door to our house and an orchard at the front. And um, this is the valley floor that, you know, this was uh, us growing up as, as, as children in Afghanistan. This was uh, reality. We were lucky in that we lived in the provinces, so the, the war and the violence that was so, uh, uh, you know, so common in the big urban areas didn't really affect us. But um, as you know, in the late 90s, um, well, you know, for the past 40 years, but especially during the late 90s when Afghanistan was going through a uh, civil war, um, a great force came in and that was known as the Taliban. And the Taliban were, um, came over and, uh, and sort of took over the country in a large sense. And at first their violence and their uh, mode of government was reduced to these great urban centres like Kabul. Um, but as they become more and more powerful, their, their reach spread further and further, even affecting us in the, in the mountains and the valleys. Uh, Dar al Palace used to be the great uh, King's Palace in Kabul. It has become a great symbol of Afghanistan and the, tra and the great transition it's been on over the last centuries. From a once famed uh, you know, palace uh, 100 years ago to being used as the Russian headquarters during the Soviet invasion, to being used, bombed and uh, shot to pieces by the Taliban through successive uh, wars. And it's become sort of a symbol for the country. Uh, right now it's going through a bit of a rebuilding phase and hopefully it'll be used as the next, um, uh, next uh, presidential palace. Um, so it came by in, um, in the early, early months of 2001, uh, the critical uh, situation in Afghanistan reached a critical point whereby um, the powers that be, or you know, the Taliban in that regard, they were getting creeping closer and closer to where we were. And I'm not sure how much you know about Afghanistan, its culture and its ethnic makeup, but there's a couple of large ethnic groups there. And as in all cases, when there's ethnic groups fighting along territorial lines, it becomes very violent. It becomes very ethnic, it becomes sectarian. And us being one uh, minor ethnic group, we were seen as um, a scapegoat and a tool for persecution. And I won't go into the details of that, but you guys are all pretty familiar with what life was like under the Taliban in the 1990s. I mean, you've seen the movies and you've read the stories, uh, the Kite Runner being one example. So it was, it was, um, the decision was made by our family that we had to leave Afghanistan as refugees. And that, that is what took place. Uh, my father made the decision that we had to leave. And at the time, um, Obviously, leaving the country, if you were seen to be leaving the country, you were deserted. You were a deserter. You were a traitor to your own kind. So uh, if you were caught leaving the country by the Taliban, then you faced uh, execution. But we left, we left Afghanistan and made our way to Pakistan, where we applied for uh, refugee status. And herein begins this great international game, this system that is set up in dealing with this movement of people. In 2000, uh, there were some two million Afghan refugees living outside of their house, I mean outside of Afghanistan and millions more internally displaced having to move, similar to the situation in Syria right now. And if you are a refugee, uh, there are certain avenues that you can walk down in terms of getting your pro application processed and hopefully finding asylum uh, somewhere else. Now the current waiting time 
to get your, from the moment you apply to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees to the time that your application is processed and you manage to get that visa to some country that um, the UNHCR sees fit, that's about 17 years. So you imagine living in a refugee camp in Zatari, like Jordan, or living in Pakistan as an illegal citizen. That is the reality that you face, unable to work, unable to live, unable to even have national recognition in that country. So your life is on hold in your own limbo. And that, that, that is one option that you can go down, and that's known as the legal route, going through the UNHCR channels. Another route, and this is what's, uh, what's come to the media and what's come to the fore at the moment, is is getting to your country on foot, physically arriving on the shores of the country in which you seek asylum. And that is the path that we chose. We weren't going to wait 16, 17 years to get our application processed. And we had heard that Australia had an open door policy to refugees. Now think where Pakistan is and think where Australia is, and it's a long way. You have to swim quite a bit. So we left. After living in Karachi for a couple of months, uh, plans were made and uh, documentations were forged and ID cards were made and we made our way, flew, and it was the first time on a plane flying from Karachi to Jakarta in Indonesia. Arrived in Indonesia and um, coming from Afghanistan, a landlocked country, to flying over the Indian Ocean, to coming to this humid, tropical rainforest of an island, it's a huge, huge culture change. Um, and we had some very novel experiences, uh, you know, having a huge language barrier, um, being introduced to all these exotic fruits like a banana. I mean, it was all very, um, very in, a, in your face the whole time. Um, keep in mind that this story that I'm telling you is, is all very retrospective. I was about seven years old at the time, in 2001 when we left, and I've uh, been living in New Zealand for about 15 years. It'll be this year. So after making our way to Jakarta, and by now we're a lot closer to Australia, as you can imagine, Jakarta is there and then you've got Australia just a few hundred kilometres to the south. The way from there is to get in contact with people smugglers, and as you know, these are people that are in the trade of people. The way to, uh, and, and getting in contact with, uh, with people smugglers who charge a hefty price, who give no guarantees, and who may have access to a boat or a vessel that could take you to that promised land. And that was the route that we took. After living in Jakarta for a couple of months, uh, you know, it was arranged with a certain, um, a certain smuggler that, that uh, who, who, who charged, I can't remember the, the monetary terms, but who said that, yeah, we can get you to Australia. And by now, uh, Indonesia is quite famous for having a very large asylum seeker population. People from all over the Middle East and Southeast Asia make their way to Indonesia because it's the final stepping stone towards Australia. And we were no exception. When we were there, there were hundreds and thousands of Afghans and Iraqis and Sri Lankans and uh, Burmese all there waiting on the next ship that would take them um, to their destination. I remember one night waking up in the in the hours before dawn, very dark, and um, Dad, uh, you know, we were all waking up to, to pack everything, and we were rushed out of this uh, dormitory that we were staying at, into the van and taken to the shore. Um, couldn't really see where you were because it was so dark, but you could sort of tell that you were by the beach or by the shoreline because of the crashing of the waves. And uh, there we were uh, at the shoreline, and you can start to see that there's a huge hubbub of activity uh, increasing. And you can't tell how many people there are, but you know that there's a lot of people gathered here. And one by one, we're sort of pushed into the belly of this ship. And we get onto this ship, this vessel, and it starts moving. And then uh, day breaks. So, you know, we'd left at about four or five in the morning and day breaks. And you get a better sense of uh, where you are. Uh, this was on the 22nd of August, 2001, or around that time. Um, your yeah, day breaks and you get a better sense of where you are and you find out that you are in the side of fishing vessel. Just a fishing trawler that's very ordinary. Uh, top deck, middle layer and then a bottom storage cabin as well. But you also get a sense that perhaps they've overloaded this place a little bit because there's a lot of people here. I mean we were crammed in, 
like, uh, like sardines. Um, and, but we had no real numbers, but at least the ship was moving and, and people were jubilant and happy that finally we had some sense of direction and we were only going to be a matter of days before we'd, um, we'd arrive in, in uh, Australia, on Australian shores. Now, everyone had packed with them all the things that they wanted to, to take with them to begin their new life abroad. Uh, clothes and books and, and any family heirlooms that they had bought with them. And that was all packed in in, in the rushed hours before you jumped on this boat. Now, the captain had promised, and the name of the, the boat was the Palapa, one, the Palapa 2. Not sure what happened to Palapa 1. Um, the name of it, so the captain had promised us an overnight journey. You jump on in the morning, you have one day overnight, and you'd arrive there the next day. Now, in that night, the, the system, the, the, <laughs> there's a word for this, but the thing that connects the engine to the propeller broke, meaning that you had no, nothing to push you. So you've got a dead engine and you're sitting inside a fishing trawler in the Indian Ocean packed with a couple of hundred uh, asylum seekers. Not exactly a great, great situation to be in. And not only that, not only did we have no sense of movement, but a great swell came in that evening as well. And now you're at the mercy of the waves, uh, mercy of the waves with no sense of actual battling or resistance, you are literally inside this boat as each wave comes and goes and um, you know as a seven year old the whole thing seems like a big adventure up until this point. You know you have no real sense of uh, location, no real sense of people around you but at that point you start to realize the gravity of the situation that you are in and you realize how sort of the risks that your parents took to try and uh, bring you somewhere else. Um, one of the lasting memories I'll have, uh, even though other bits are very vague, one of the lasting memories I'll have was there were certain parents with very, very young kids who were holding them very tightly and they were whispering under their breath that perhaps if we were to perish tonight, then please at least wash our, bo uh, wash our bodies on shore so we can be buried on land. And now that gives you a crystal clear picture of the mental state that these people were in. And through some act of mercy from above, or whatever you want to call it, divine intervention, we managed to survive that night as the ship was taking in water and as holes were being um, you know, broken into the side of the ship. We managed to survive that night to sunny skies the next day. But still the situation remained where the boat had no sense of movement. Give you a sense of distance there from Jakarta to Christmas Island, which was our destination, uh, which is an offshore Australian territory. So going from Jakarta to Christmas Island, now the goal was that if you physically arrive on the shores of Christmas Island, similar to what's happening right now in the, in the Mediterranean with Lesbos and Edomini, if you arrive on the shores of Christmas Island, then you are a refugee and the country or the sovereign governing that territory uh, does not have the legal right to turn you back. As day broke, um, people started to get a sense of hope because a plane, an Australian Border Patrol plane, flew overhead that night, that, that morning. And it came and did a few circles and then it, uh, we, did, we weren't sure if, if it had seen us or not and it, uh, and it returned. And then it came back a couple of hours later and out of the hundreds that were with us, there was one person who had the English knowledge to write the letters SOS on a towel and sort of wave it in the air. The ship, uh, the plane did another couple of circles overhead and then it turned back. And then as morning turned to afternoon, we saw out of this horizon this great big red wall of metal coming towards you. And you, didn't, and you weren't sure if this thing's actually seen you or not because in comparison, um, this thing just seemed like a great big wall. And that was the Tampa, the MV Tampa, which probably made headlines here uh, around that time. And that's a ship there in 2006. And that was us. The ship came towards us and it stopped right in the middle of the, you know, right next to us, literally. And it's about 12 stories high to the, to the, uh, to the top deck. And uh, the captain released this long ladder that just kept breaking and breaking and it reached just the top 
of uh, the, the Palapa too. And the sailors came down the ladder and one by one just sort of uh, looked around and they sort of estimated that there might be, you know, 80 to 100, 150 people with us. So one, one sailor stood at the end of the ladder, another sailor stood on the deck of the Palapa and we were just sort of thrown up <laughs> to the guy who'd receive us and he said, up you get. And we just sort of hand crawl up this ladder onto the top of the, the, the tamper. And I remember once you got to the top, the guy would write a number on your wrist just so they could keep a track of how many people they'd, um, they'd picked up. And the last number was 438. 438 people, mostly Afghans. I think there's about 400 Afghans, uh, a few Sri Lankans, a few Pakistanis as well. But the large majority of them was, um, were Afghans. 438, and you know the colloquial saying, literally the clothes on your back, that applied very, very literally on that instant. Uh, no shoes either because they didn't know what you could carry in your shoes. So literally the shirt on your back and, and your shorts and you, and you jump on the ship and as the last person, as the sailor himself sort of managed to have a look around the ship, make sure that there was nobody left, he, um, he jumped back on the ladder and the Palapa 2 sank with everything that people had bought to start their new life and now it's sitting at the bottom of the Indian Ocean somewhere. So I wonder if there's going to be a Palapa 3. <laughs> Life on board. Life on board the Tampa. Um, obviously, this is by no means a criticism of the treatment that we got on the Tampa because this guy, Captain Arne Rinnan, a Norwegian sailor from, from teenagehood, and this is going to be one of his last voyages, he was going here to actually um, going from Fremantle, Western Australia, to Singapore with some industrial goods. And he managed to, uh, Australian Border Patrol sort of signaled because he was the closest vessel to go and pick them up. And they did. And that was life on board. We lived in containers, men and women separate, children separate, separate containers for um, toilets. And people just sort of rode sitting day by day. Now here's where it becomes very international. And here's where the story really becomes a, a huge diplomatic affair. Because all of a sudden you have a Norwegian container ship picking up a boatload of Afghan refugees in international waters coming from our Indonesia, heading to Australia. And here you've got a lot of parties involved and there's, um, and it could go completely one way or the other way and, and that's what you saw and that's why the Tampa became this, this um, as one uh, expert called it, a, a detonator issue in, in Australian and um, Australian politics. Because it drives a wedge in society and that's, and at the time, in 2001, um, Australia was going through a federal election. So this was the Howard era, and uh, you guys are pretty familiar with, with how that election turned out, and how it ended up winning. So what suddenly seemed like a humanitarian affair, picking up the boatload of asylum seekers, became a huge, huge issue of national security and national identity. And we weren't willing to go back because we were so damn close, and we weren't willing to go back and Renan, knowing that international law said that you were supposed to drop, uh, drop your asylum seekers at the first port of call, being Christmas Island, said, I will drop you off at Christmas Island. Now, keep in mind, out of the 438 people, there was one person that could speak English. Uh, we're heading towards Christmas Island, we start to see this island emerge out of the horizon, just a piece of rock in the middle of the sea, and we're getting closer and closer. And uh, Australian Border Patrol had been notified that uh, Arne Rinnan, the captain, had notified them that he was going to drop these asylum seekers on Australian soil. And that's when the Australian uh, Navy boarded the ship with SAS and said, turn the, turn the ship around, you're not welcome. And so obviously he couldn't refuse. At the same time, uh, the Tampa couldn't hold us because Obviously, it's a company. It's going to get charged every day for that its uh, shipment is late. So uh, an arrangement was made to transfer us from the Tampa to the HMAS Menorah, an Australian Navy frigate. Now, while we were on the Menorah, um, a large number of things happened. Uh, first of all, New Zealand raised its hand to say that we are willing to accept 150 or so uh, of the 438. We're willing to accept 150, and those have to be young families. So 
that would include me and my parents and, and, and my brothers and sisters that came along. And, and another couple of things happened. On 9th of September, um, the Taliban uh, went and assassinated the last person, the last force of resistance uh, in Afghanistan, who was Ahmad Shah Massoud. He was holding the, large, the last piece of, of, of uh, resistance in Afghanistan, which with his assassination, then the, the, all of Afghanistan was taken over. And then obviously two days later we had 9-11. So suddenly every brown Middle Eastern person is a potential uh, uh, terror threat. And that slowed this whole thing down quite a lot because even New Zealand sort of said, well, what are our legal, legal obligations now? Because we've said they will accept them, but we don't know what sort of security threat that they pose us. And the 9-11 the attacks really um, took the wind out of any argument um, on the Australian uh, front to accept more refugees. So we were transferred to the menorah and we ended up staying there for about 22, 23 days on this ship whilst this international wrangling went on. And uh, after that we were, a uh, solution was made that yes, New Zealand would stay, to, it would stay true, to its, true to its obligation and um, these young families will be accepted into New Zealand. Of the 438, over half eventually managed to get their asylum application approved. Um, some went to Australia in the end, some stayed at the Nauru uh, Processing Centre, that red dot uh, over there. So the Christmas Island, Nauru and Auckland. Nauru is the offshore processing centre that um, it's contracted to Australia. And their application process took somewhere between two to five years. People had just had to wait there while all this was going on. But we were lucky and, and, and that never, that's never lost on me that um, being in our situation we didn't have to wait. We stayed in Nauru for half a day while a charter plane came from Auckland to pick us up and eventually we made it to uh, Mangere Refugee Centre. Three month, usually it's a six week, but for us being a special case, uh, you know, three month integration process where we learned the basics of, of life in New Zealand. Um, customs and laws and I learned my ABCs in Mangere as a seven year old and, and uh, you know transferred throughout New Zealand and uh, been in Christchurch in New Zealand ever since. So that brings me to the second part of this um, presentation which is uh, what is the larger picture here and, and where does the role, what, what's the role of the UN when it comes to dealing with this mass movement of people. Uh, first of all, it all began with the 1948 United Nations um, Declaration of Human Rights, which sort of guarantees everyone the right to life and security and to li live a life of dignity. Um, following on from that was the establishment of the UNHCR, and you would have seen those white tents with the blue UNHCR logo at every refugee camp. And then the following year, uh, they had the convention relating to the status of refugees, which New Zealand was a signatory to, and it gave a formal definition to what it means to be a refugee. Keep in mind that the UNHCR was established uh, to deal with the millions and millions of displaced refugees following World War II, all or the large majority of which were in, was in Europe. And uh, that uh, definition still applies today. So the convention relating to the status of refugees, uh, there's two main points that are at contention at the moment. And um, that's what we're starting to see. First of all, it's the innocence of refugees that as soon as someone arrives onto the shores of a sovereign country, then it's innocent before you're proven guilty. And it means you apply for asylum until your application is approved and processed. You're considered a refugee. And two, non-refoulement, which is exactly as, as mentioned before. Uh, if you're a signatory to the treaty, then you, you cannot physically turn those people around once they've arrived on your shores. And that's what we're starting to see in Europe because if these refugees have arrived on the shores of Europe, on Greece, then they cannot be turned back. So what's New Zealand's position in all this? Uh, we were a signatory to the 51 Convention. Um, then we had the Pacific Solution of 2001 and that was the Australian um, that was the Australian plan in dealing with the arrival of boat people, as it was known. And it just meant that um, New Zealand would take a certain uh, percentage of arrivals coming to Australia through an agreement with, with the Australian government. 
Then we had, uh, in 2012, we had an uh, Immigration Mass Arrivals Amendment Bill, which meant that uh, any illegal arrival of 30 or more people, um, you know, this is an illegal vessel entry into New Zealand, 30 or more people uh, subject to six months detention um, upon arrival. And uh, New Zealand's had an annual quota of 750 refugees, and this hasn't changed for uh, 30 years. It, uh, last year, at the real height of the Syrian refugee crisis, when we saw those tragic pictures of Ailan Kurdi, um, and that really provoked a rather emotional response amongst people, there was uh, approval to take in an extra 600 Syrian refugees um, through 2018, uh, 250 a year or so in New Zealand. And the first arrivals of that actually happened, um, the first arrival of that actually happened a couple of weeks ago. We had 45 Syrian refugees arrive in Dunedin and another 45 arrive in Wellington. New Zealand's refugee intake, so as you can see that's the um, 750, that's the blue bars, you know, on or around that much that we fill up. Uh, that big red spike in the middle was us. Uh, that uh, caused us. Um, the, red, the red actually represents uh, asylum applications. So that just means people who arrive. Um, so a refugee is someone who has to leave his natural home and they could be moved inside their own country or they move to an external country. An asylum seeker is someone who arrives onto the shores of another country, uh, li like us. Now we take 750 um, quota refugees through the United Nations and then we also accept around about uh, 30 to 40 asylum seekers. Now these are people who manage to actually get themselves to New Zealand and then once here they apply uh, uh, for asylum, which means that they say Immigration New Zealand that I cannot go back because I feel in danger. Uh, how does that compare? Refugees per thousand people, this, this chart was established, uh, uh, this was of information in 2014. Um, so it just sort of paints a picture of, of, of how we're doing. It used to be that uh, we were number one and now we're about 87th in the world, I think, in terms of um, refugees per head of population. Um, and, and there are many, uh, many arguments for and, for and against um, taking a greater number of refugees, one of them being the economic case that they are a, rather a boon, or if they are a boon or rather are they a burden. A lot of studies have concluded that no, they are in fact a um, net, you know, if you're talking economic terms, and they were a, a net benefit to the economy. But, you know, despite that, there remains a lot of um, friction or, or points of contention because, and this is not something new, by the way, this is something that New Zealand or any other uh, developed country has seen over the time. I think uh, if you remember, if you remember the Irish when they first arrived in New Zealand, or any other Western country in America or Australia. It used to be that you might have signs on the door saying, help wanted, and Irish need not apply. Um, in the 50s, when, when communism was a huge thing, it used to be that socialism or anyone deemed communist was a huge threat to the survival of our country. Uh, in the 70s, we had the great uh, Vietnamese uh, boat people, and that's where the term boat people actually came from because these people literally jumped on a boat down the Mekong to try and get away from what was happening in their country. So we had the Vietnamese or the Indo-Chinese as it were back then. And then even following World War II we had this large, large influx of Polish refugees that were, um, you know, accommodated into New Zealand. Uh, a lot of this actually is, tends to do with security concerns. Now when uh, someone wants to be, uh, applies for Someone applies to the UNHCR for refugee status, please relocate me somewhere. The UNHCR goes through a rigorous interview process whereby every or as much detail as possible about that applicant is, is, is taken down <coughs> over a series of interviews with that person, with their family members, with their networks and connections. They try and get access to the database of the source country to see, to try and get as much uh, background about them as possible, any criminal allegations or whatnot, and they compile a pile. So let's say I apply for refugee status, there'll be a big folder with my name on it. And then that folder is passed on to anyone that's a signatory to the UNHCR. So New Zealand being a signatory, that folder might be given to New Zealand. Immigration New Zealand looks at that folder and says, is this person going to be of value or is this, going to be a pers is this person going to be a security threat to New Zealand? Um, Immigration New Zealand, or rather the New Zealand government, is also part of the Five Eyes Intelligence Network, uh, 
which means that they have access to the, uh, all the intelligence held by the US, Canada, Australia and uh, the UK. So they are part of the Five Eyes Intelligence Network. So that means that they have access to this huge amount of resources to pretty much check my name to see if anything comes up across in the British files or the Canadian files. And then after that, um, they make the final tick of approval, yes, no, we want this person. And then from then on, the process of relocation can, uh, can happen. Uh, but, you know, regardless, then this is a huge process. So if you wanted to actually do some harm to a country, you're putting yourself through a lot of bureaucracy to do that. Um, so it, despite that rigorous process, and in the US, as you can imagine, there's about seven layers of security before uh, you can actually arrive at, uh, on, on their soil. And obviously they've got numerous, numerous um, intelligence agencies to do that. Despite this, security concerns probably tops the list. Um, culture gap, and this is, um, this is very interesting because if, if refugees come from a culture that's similar to ours, then we don't usually bat an eye because of, say, we're doing something. But then if, if they come from a country that we're not really familiar with, then questions are raised. Um, I think there's a huge culture gap in, uh, between East and West, between, uh, you know, how much, how much relatability is there between you guys, you know, between myself and, and someone coming from Syria, do you know what I mean? There's a huge language barrier, there's a cultural barrier, there might be a religious barrier in that regard. So there's a gap that needs filling, and I think the way to do that is that uh, refugees coming here, um, you know, reach out to us, but at the same time, we reach out towards them to try and bridge that gap. Now, I'm not sure how many of you guys sitting here came here because you knew the story of a refugee or because you wanted to know more, or how, much, how many of you guys here have actually had contact with a refugee, do you know what I mean? Because that, that says a lot about, about the, the culture gap that exists. Also, there's a case to be made about the economic tides of welcoming. So if our economy is doing great and there's plenty of jobs to go around and people have a stable source of income, then accepting more refugees doesn't seem like an issue. But if there's a, God forbid, a housing shortage or high unemployment, then suddenly there's a lot more competition. Now in Europe, it's interesting because Germany is doing fantastically well in its economy and they've got about half a million jobs they need filling. So they are desperate for workers to come in. But all the other European countries aren't doing so well. So therefore any uh, for example, Spain or Italy, so any income or influx of people coming in is suddenly seen as a threat. And that sort of comes down to the argument of whether we're, you know, pegging our generosity to the availability of, 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 of how much income is available. Um, addressing long-term causes, obviously a country like New Zealand, you look at what's happening in the Middle East and you say, where do you begin? And, and that's a very, very valid case to be made. And, I'm, and in advocating or at least uh, trying to uh, increase the debate around refugees, relocation is not the, the be all and end all. In fact, it's the last, last resort. Accepting another couple of hundred people coming from these war zones isn't going to be, it's going to be a drop in the ocean in regards to what's happening out there. So addressing long-term causes, and I think Germany's in the right path to do this, is is looking at why people move in the first place and taking a 20, 30 and 40 year approach to try and, and, and deal with that. And it's also about uh, global citizenship, you know, doing our bit on the global scale. We always say, you know, we punch above our weight when it comes to anything on the international scale. And, um, you know, those sort of figures paint a different picture. I'd, um, I'd like to um, uh, play the first couple of minutes of this video that really, I think, paints a very accurate, in my mind, a very accurate picture of, of how the debate should be framed. It shouldn't be uh, framed around security or economic benefit or whatnot, but rather a clash of cultures. You can find the link to that video. Thanks for coming along, guys, and um, you know, open the floor to, to questions.